Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers from around the world. Thank you for joining us for this event, Human Capital at the Crossroads. I'm Rochelle Akufo, your host for today's event. Now, investments in education, health, social protection, jobs, and gender equality that build human capital are intrinsically important for individual well-being, creating more equitable societies, sustaining economic growth, and preventing millions of people from falling into poverty. Now, more than at any other time in living memory, human capital is being dealt devastating blows by conflict, climate change, and the COVID-19 pandemic. The losses to learning, health outcomes, livelihoods, and gender equality have immediate and long-term impacts on people's well-being and can undermine economic recovery and prosperity for years to come. Well, today we'll hear from leaders, innovators, and change makers who are taking action to put people at the heart of recovery. We will hear firsthand how such investments can not only change lives for individuals, but also create more inclusive and equitable societies. Now, you'll be inspired by how so many are coming together to rebuild and reclaim the future for today's generation and those to come. A reminder that you can watch this event live in English, Spanish, French or Arabic at live.worldbank.org. So here's a quick look at what's coming up over the next 90 minutes. Such an impressive and diverse range of voices. We're in for some very interesting discussions as we explore how protecting and investing in people is central to sustainable, resilient and inclusive development. Well, to kick us off, I'm delighted to introduce the President of the United Republic of Tanzania, Her Excellency Samia Suluhu Hassan. Now, President Samia is the first female president of her country and is a powerful agent and voice for change. She's a champion for gender equality and economic empowerment for women and girls. In addition, she has reset Tanzania's response to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, including access to effective COVID-19 vaccines. We're delighted to have this opportunity today to hear from President Samir on her country's progress and approach. Now, she is joining David Malpass, the president of the World Bank Group, for a conversation on the importance of protecting and investing in human capital. Over to you, President Malpass. Th thank you very much, uh, Rochelle, and thank you, Madam President, for joining us uh, today. The, we've had meetings all week. The, the theme of the meetings is both the challenges facing mm -hmm. countries. That's COVID, that's inflation, mm -hmm. that's the insecurity and the, the war in Ukraine, all facing uh, leaders mm -hmm. around the world, mm -hmm. and also what some of the solutions are. One of the key areas uh, for, for, for progress is human capital itself. No. Well, uh, unfortunately, through the COVID crisis, uh, there was a loss of education, mm. a loss of progress on health, on nutrition, mm. and that, that's our topic for today. Mm. So I, I, our audience is very interested in your approach and your thinking about how to resume mm. progress on human capital. Okay. What are the key steps? Okay, human capital is uh, imparted uh, in our five years development plan, uh, the third uh, uh, development plan, but also in the vision, the 20 years vision, uh, which started in 2020 to 2025. So um, for us, uh, uh, human capital involves uh, uh, actions with uh, uh, social service to the people. And by social service, we start with health, somebody has to be health to be able to live uh, in peace and to live happily but then he has to get education then he has to get safe and uh, clean clean and safe water and that's part of health then uh, 
He has to be happy living with, the, with, the, with others. He has to have something to do to earn his or her own bread. So talking of education, we have made a stride. First of all, we are offering free education for all, at least from pre-primary to primary and secondary education, free education for all. And uh, we have made a stride in 2015 our enrollment was about 58.8, uh, .8, and now we are almost, no, we, we were at 80 percent, 80 percent, and we are almost 95.5 percent. So we are going to 100 percent enrollment, and it's free for all boys and girls. And then uh, talking of secondary schools, we are continuing with the free education, and most of our kids go to secondary school. But then we have created a fund whereby when they go to universities, they have to borrow money from that fund, go for the education. And then they are paying back when they get employed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether self-employment or they get employed somewhere. That's when they are paying back. And we have done so knowing that um, if we leave or we left the burden of uh, educating those kids in, uh, in, uh, in uh, universities, the parents couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So we have created a fund. But then in, uh, in the same way in education, you remember we had a ban of uh, adolescent mothers to go back to school. Mm -hmm. And now we have uh, uh, lifted that ban. Now the adolescent mothers, the dropouts, whether boys or girls, uh, adolescent mothers or not, they are free to go back to school to complete the education, at least at the primary level. But some of them, they are doing good. We have a very good example in Zanzibar, where this ban was lifted long ago, and most of the uh, adolescent mothers went back to school, and now they are completing their uh, university education. So we thought we should give that um, um, privilege to the adolescent mothers and the dropouts. But then on, the, uh, on health, we have done well, still we are having uh, um, challenges, but our policy is uh, health for all, and we have tried hard. We have different segments of health service. We have the village uh, level, then uh, ward level, district level, uh, regional level, then national referral level. So we have done well from the district, regional, and um, referral. We have tried. But then we are now concentrating on the village level because we learned it from COVID. Uh, we need to have the first aid, first treatment down to the village. Mm -hmm. So now we are concentrating on the uh, village level of where, as I'm talking, we have done about you know, Tanzania is having about 12,300 villages. And uh, before my time, we have built around five to 6,000 centers, health centers at the village level. And we are continuing. As we are talking, I am having a project of about 333 uh, dispensaries built at the village, mm -hmm. just to add on what we have done. So in health sector, we, 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 we have tried that much, but we still do have challenge. The challenge is uh, we have done very well on infrastructure, but now to improve the quality of uh, the services which are given to the people. Who provides the health care at that village level? Uh, the government, of course. Uh -huh. Yeah, the government. A nurse, uh, are, do doctors travel through? How does it the, break down? The, they, they call them the assistant medical officers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are doing the, the services down to the village. And of course, every uh, dispensary is having two nurses plus a medical doctor, assistant mm -hmm. medical doctor. And do they look at ch nutrition? Uh, will they identify children that are yes. that are either undernourished yes. or have the incorrect uh, yes. vitamins and so on? Yes. And, uh, yeah, because we are starting um, giving service to the mothers when they are pregnant. Make sure they all have folic acids, uh, mm -hmm. avoid pneumonia, uh, uh, anemia, and so that they can give birth to healthy babies. 
And when the babies are born, we take all the necessary measures, vaccination, checking whether they are disabled or not, then uh, the early, early, early services, health services, we are trying to give them all. And that used to be a big problem in Tanzania, the, the, the childbirth uh, complications. Yes. Is it, but th th can that improve the situation rapidly? Um, because it, we're talking about a nine-month period or a, a, mm -hmm. a one-year period mm -hmm. before birth. Uh, yeah. how, did, how is that going? We have improved. We have improved because uh, five years, uh, uh, five years back, mm -hmm. we were talking of let's say 120 deaths per 100,000 uh -huh. for babies, uh -huh. uh, uh, zero to one years, and now we are talking of about 27. Oh. Only so 27. So an 80% improvement yes, or cut yes, in the, yes. which is huge. And this is because we are taking care of the pregnant mother and then we are giving um, necessary services when the child is, is, is being born. Our health centers down to the villages, they provide theaters for the pregnant mothers, the complicated ones, to be operated and save their lives for both babies and mothers. I see. But then, uh, yeah, we are still struggling with uh, maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. We have reduced it a great deal, but the numbers are still not acceptable. What do you find are the challenges in the, both in education and in health? Is it a fiscal, is it the amount of money, or is it to train the personnel, or is it imports that are, what, what are the biggest challenges? I think it's a mixture, because anyway, oh, in education, the challenge was the acceptance of parents to send the kids to school. Uh -huh. Yeah, because especially girls. Yes, especially girls. Uh -huh. And in some societies, the 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 hard keepers, the livestock keepers, they prefer their kids to go for herding yeah. rather than going to school. So we had to educate the parents to accept sending their kids to school. But number two challenge was infrastructure, the um, lack of class classrooms. But now we have done, we are, we are done with that. We are still having shortages, but not as much as it was before. The third challenge is the number of teachers. Be able to employ teachers which would be enough for every school in the whole country. That was our challenge. And but qualified, we have been, do you is there a qualification standard or is that important with the the quality of the teacher how do you think about that the quality of the teachers yes but uh, we are taking on the quality of the teachers in science subjects mm -hmm. that's where we are struggling mm -hmm. the art subjects we are having enough mm -hmm. the challenge with the art subject is the capacity of the government to employ more teachers. But for the science subjects, yes, we are still struggling, training more science subject mm -hmm. teachers. Yeah, we are working on that. And do you find, our, is there a difference between women teachers and men teachers as far as effectiveness? Yeah. Which way? Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, the health and education sector employs more women uh -huh. than men. Uh -huh. So we are having more female teachers than male in numbers. Mm -hmm. Also in health sector, we're having more uh, female nurses than men. But when you go up to the doctors, mm -hmm. doctors, we're having more male doctors than female mm -hmm. doctors, yeah. Well, someday so, maybe those yeah. can balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is because when we were moving to our education, uh, former, stream of, uh, former stream of education, girls kept on dropping yeah kept on dropping and they were not much on science subjects than men yeah. but nowadays that that gap has been reduced and, and we find if girls are educated uh, given the chance they do very well oh, in yes. math and science oh yes um, i know you've been a big promoter of, of girls education yes. and also uh, uh countering gender-based violence mm -hmm. um how is that going and what are the obstacles uh to that i mean is it 
educating the society not to allow it, or what, what's most effective? Yeah, you know, before the gender-based education, we had both. We had the legal frameworks, and then we had education. But then uh, with the legal frameworks, you know, most of those who are victims of gender-based uh, violence wouldn't like to go for legal frameworks. Mm -hmm. Would like them to fix things at home, mm -hmm. yeah. So we go for education. And education, I think we, we started wrongly by educating women only. But now we have realized that both have to be educated, men and women. Uh -huh. That gender-based violence is neither good for men mm -hmm. nor for women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we, we are conducting, the NGO, the, the civil society organizations, are conducting training for all of them. Yeah. That's, a, that's an important insight. Yes. That the, I, I mean, it's obvious when you say it yes. that, uh, that men are part of the problem and mm -hmm. have to be educated yes. and, and, uh, and, and brought forward mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, other, do, do you, any advice? Uh, we'll, we'll, we have a, few, a couple more minutes, but do you have advice mm -hmm. for other leaders? You've been a strong leader, a new leader. Mm -hmm. uh, important to move fast, or mm -hmm. what, what do you take? away from your experience? Yeah, from my experience, um, I think everybody needs to be a good leader to his or her country. But then we are having challenges. Uh, with these challenges might be supported um, or the government be supported by different uh, multilateral institutions, bilateral uh, means to eradicate those challenges. But we do have challenges of uh, maybe to improve the qualities of health and education, challenges of provision of safe and clean water to our people, challenges of uh, provision of green energy to our people. And now we are talking of green energy. And the international organizations come up with new terminologies every now and then. Green energy, leave this, don't use that. But they have to look at the situations we are in. Because as we are talking now, we are, we are told to go for green energy. For us in, in, in Africa, for example, we can go for uh, uh, hydropower, we can go for solar, we can go for gas, and this is being put in question mark, but we have a lot of gas, we can go for gas. We can go for thermal and wind mm -hmm. uh, those are the the, the uh -huh. green sources of energy but we need support to generate energy from those sources you're doing a remarkable job and we're looking for ways to expand our program and i'm particularly mm -hmm. happy to hear about the progress Great. in education mm -hmm. in health and uh, gender-based violence these mm -hmm. are all key to the future of yes. tanzania yes um, thank, you thank you very much very madam much. president i'll th I'll go back to Rochelle. Mm, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And a very big thank you to you as well, President Samir, for sharing your insights. Well, please do share your thoughts on that discussion and those to come. You can post your comments using the hashtag invest in people and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. And you can also post comments and questions at live.worldbank.org. That way we have experts standing by to answer your questions in English, Spanish, French and Arabic. And you can see some of them in action right here. Well, we'll be putting some of the most popular questions to two bank experts at the end of today's event. Marhaba. I'm Nabil Darwish in Amman and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meetings. The world has been facing a global learning crisis for some time. Countries are faced with issues of inadequate resources and many children lack access to quality education. And then, of course, comes the COVID-19 pandemic. To really understand how COVID has escalated the learning crisis, let's look at the latest data. Now, remember, we define learning poverty as being unable to read and understand a simple text by age 10. 
So how did the pandemic affect students around the world? Well, at its peak, 1.6 billion children were impacted by COVID-19 related school closures. And this really was a global crisis. 188 countries were impacted. So how has that unprecedented hit on schooling affected learning poverty? Well, back in 2015, the rate of learning poverty in low and middle income countries was 53%. And just to give you a sense of the global disparity in high income countries, that figure was just 9%. So it may be some time before we have the final data on the impact of the pandemic, but the projections are startling. Recent simulations suggest that learning poverty could have increased to 70%, a rise of 17 percentage points. To understand the extent to which this pandemic has derailed progress, take a look at this blue line, which shows the international target for learning poverty, which was to halve the rate by 2030. That ambitious target now appears unattainable. Well, clearly, we must get learning back on track and accelerate progress. Tackling learning poverty is a crucial component to building a country's human capital. But we must also ensure we are giving children the best possible start in life. How we best go about this is something upon which our first panel of guests all have interesting perspectives. I'm joined now by three global leaders who understand that investing in the early years helps to break the cycle of poverty, address inequality, and boost productivity. I'm joined here by Mari Pangestu, World Bank Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships, Malala Yousafzai, co-founder of the Malala Fund, the youngest ever Nobel laureate and a tireless advocate for a girl's right to education, and Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, a very warm Warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us on this important day. A lot of important conversations to be had. Mari, I want to first start with you. The devastating impact of school closures on learning outcomes with the spiraling learning poverty threatens to derail an entire generation. What are the extents of the challenges and what should be done? Uh, thanks, Rochelle. Uh, it's great pleasure to be on this panel with Ma Amina Mohammed, my old friend, and of course Malala as a role model for the right for girls to have education. Uh, I think just to put the context of the challenges, you know, we've never had such a situation in the world where you had long global lockdown of schools. The average is 286 days that schools were closed down. And in some regions like South Asia, it's very high. It's like 400. Uh, 80 days. So that's a year to a, almost two years of kids not being in school. So the learning losses uh, are, are something that uh, will be the big challenge. And uh, the uh, impact of not going to school and uh, loss of uh, learning is also unequal in its impact, affecting young children the most, uh, as well as those in poorer households and those who are not connected. You know, to the extent that remote learning is available, but if you don't have connectivity, uh, you will not be able to, to reach uh, any type of uh, remote learning. UNICEF estimates that 31% of school children could not uh, access any kind of uh, remote learning. Uh, so these are uh, the challenges, and it translates into a lost decade of development, and you can actually put a number to it, which is $17 trillion uh, worth of lost earnings uh, because of, of the, uh, the re region learning and that's 14% of the world GDP what needs to be done I think this is really uh, what we are all uh, working uh, with our partners and and with countries how can we address this we need swift and urgent action first of all get kids back to school because we also know there has also been a high dropout rates uh, kids not coming back to school even as schools opening up especially girls uh, and this happened uh, with the Ebola crisis where uh, less girls came back to school. So we've got to create uh, the incentives for uh, kids to come back to school and stay in school, uh, especially girls. Incentives, uh, combine it with school meals, um, uh, making sure, uh, like in Brazil, we're working with the Brazilian government to, to sort of have a check system, a survey system, uh, to understand where, uh, when kids are not coming back to school and, and finding uh, how to get them back to school. And creating safe schools for, for girls is, is very important. Second, how do you regain the learning losses? And it's not just the one or one and a half years of not going to school that's lost. 
it, they've also forgotten what they learned even when they were in school. So this accelerated learning recovery really needs a, a focus uh, in terms of the programs that we need to design, the teachers that we need to train to be able to have the tools and resources uh, to address this. Uh, and then third, as we are addressing the learning uh, recovery, uh, we should also be addressing what, what we need to change uh, for the more medium term uh, education uh, issues. The core skills, how do we get teachers uh, to be trained, and we are also looking at what we call school beyond walls, the important role of parents and communities as well uh, in the learning. And, and you know, the whole digital divide, uh, we need to address uh, how, to, how uh, the remote learning and using digital and connectivity is very important. And you know, I just want to share one, uh, we are, we're working with a lot of countries on this. One, uh, one, area in, uh, one area that is important, how do you develop tools and uh, train teachers to, have, uh, to understand the differentiated learning needs uh, of, of, of children. So in Gujarat, we actually uh, have tools to have teachers uh, look at the learning needs of kids uh, every week and then adjust the learning materials uh, to, to be able to adjust for the different needs. Uh, this is the kind of thing uh, that needs to also happen uh, on the ground as we really address the urgent uh, need for recovering the losses. And the final thing I would say is funding, of course. <laughs> How can we uh, really raise this awareness uh, for governments to allocate sufficient budget uh, for, for recovering these learning losses? Otherwise, it's a lost generation and you know, loss of future uh, income. And then also, how does the international community come around uh, to really uh, help uh, to accelerate this uh, regaining of, of the learning losses? And as you mentioned, this really is a holistic approach that needs to be taken. A real wake-up call, obviously, with COVID building on what was already happening in the yes. education system. Um, Malala, I want to bring you in here because in some regions and contexts, very few students are able to read. How do we address this and what special considerations are needed from a gender and fragility context? Yes, I think um, in this time, education advocates need to take the issue of the quality of education more seriously. We know that when children enroll into schools, there's also the issue of what they learn in their classrooms. Uh, so it's the access to education, but also the quality of education that are important. Um, we know that uh, there is also the element of gender in it. Girls do outperform boys in, uh, in arts and, and, and they're also catching up on maths as well. Uh, but if we look at you know, the averages, averages only tell us half, of, uh, half the story. Uh, we need to dig deeper into this and look at how girls from marginalized, from low-income communities are more impacted. They're less likely to excel in these uh, academic subjects. Uh, and, and there's also the issue of, um, of, of crisis. When external crises hit uh, an economy, girls are usually the first ones to drop out and the last ones to return to their classrooms. So we need to look at the factor of gender, the factor of uh, their, uh, their, their background as well to ensure that we are addressing uh, the, um, the, you know, we are addressing the issues that are there in, in the systems. And uh, we also know that, uh, that, you know, we need policies that are more inclusive, holistic, and also creative when we are talking about the future of education. This pandemic has taught us that we need to consider education beyond just a classroom um, and, and think about how we can use digital platforms as tools for education. And I hope that this is a time when our leaders, when our policymakers realize that this is an urgent issue. This is a crisis that needs to be addressed sooner. Every year, children are losing out on access to education. Girls are left behind because of lack of access to schools and it's and the number is in millions we still live in a world where 127 million girls do not have access to education we want this to change we want all children in any part of the world to be able to go to school to have dreams and to make those dreams come true for themselves so i hope that policymakers, experts uh, do more for this cause and uh, we know that they are making uh, good verbal statements, but now it's time that they take action as well. They increase their finance for, they increase financing for education. We know that they have been uh, very, the, the we know that 
financing for education has been stagnant. There has been little increase, and uh, and you know uh, we so we need that, but we also need an investment in the quality of education as well. And as you mentioned there, in terms of, of COVID-19, I mean, I want to bring you in here because we know that COVID-19 has been the biggest setback to human capital in living memory. What are the unique impacts on young people and what are the key priorities to get back on track? Okay, thank you very much. And it's great to be with uh, Malala and with Mary um, on a subject that is so important in us taking advantage of the recovery. Um, and and it, is, it is about the socioeconomic recovery. Um, from COVID, and, and now we have another exacerbating crisis with the war in Ukraine. Um, I think, you know, Mary has spoken to really the facts and figures um, for the learning losses. Um, and I think that that's, you know, something that we really need to think about is that they were there before COVID. We were having children dropping out. We were having many who couldn't read or write. I mean, we have had this situation for decades. So what are we going to do differently? And I think that this is the question now for us to rethink education and to have a rebirth of the way the future, the next generation are going to have education. The learning losses showed us that even if you had connectivity, teachers were not prepared to, to teach and learners were not prepared to learn, even though we thought we had them connected. And I think that those lessons um, are important that we invest um, in the capacities uh, for, for, uh, for knowledge and for learning to happen and for the right skill sets for that individual uh, to contribute A, to themselves, but B, to the community and the society at large. Um, many of the learning losses were compounded by many issues, not just not having access to education, but remember we did the school feeding around the world to make sure that at least that one square meal um, happened and we, we got better nutrition. We lost that, not just in, in the global south, but even in the global north. Here in New York, um, we had 300,000 meals that people had to come and collect just because they fell out of school. Um, but we also, I think, learned uh, very quickly um, that uh, the, 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 the importance of um, the curriculum itself. Um, and I think that when we are thinking forward and rebirthing education, that we will need to give a lot more thought to what is education for, and we cannot have this cookie cutter where in every country we aspire to one norm, which may not work for us. Um, and I, we saw that in, in, in the learning losses um, that, 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 that happened as we went along. Um, my greatest concern for what has happened during this time with young people and, and really listening to them when I visited Costa Rica, a girls' school there, and just listened to the young girls, was in fact the mental health dimension to this. Um, you know, the head is on the body. And, and we often talk about the health of the body, but we don't talk about the health of the head. And, and we are one. Um, and as they came out of this, the anxiety that they had, uh, the depression that set in, uh, you know, the, the lack of uh, connect human interaction that was missing uh, from the new classroom. Um, and in fact, uh, with the crises that not being able uh, to deal with um, a what happens next? What is my future about? How am I going to connect with it? Uh, can I catch up? Will I be left behind? Um, and I think that these um, in crisis situations, in normal situations, are all going to come in the aftermath of as we try to get back on track. And so for us um, at the United Nations, working with partners in the country level, the uh, transforming education conversation has to happen at the local level. And we should take this as an advantage in trying to build back better. So when we speak to the investments that are needed in trying to achieve the 2030 agenda and the SDGs, we've got to do it differently um, and perhaps make good on all the promises that we've had um, for, uh, for young people, uh, for communities, for countries, that education truly is the foundation, truly is the cornerstone. I think we've got to get past that and, and make use of this crisis. There is a silver lining there, but it's about being very clear um, on the steps um, and acknowledging, um, you know, not that it wasn't COVID just opened up, um, you know, and made more urgent for us to get um, a, a response and to get it um, in it with a sense of urgency. Education can't wait, it really can't. Um, and uh, girls are, are at the forefront of losing that. Or that's half your population. Uh, we cannot be without you know, half our population. This doesn't work. Um, maybe finally, I would say we, we have spoken about not leaving anyone behind. I'm really, really concerned about the number of boys and young men we're leaving behind. In the end, women and girls have to live in a society with boys and men. 
And, and this needs to be a place where the next generation does this together. So while we catch up with the girls, I still want us to remember that there are many boys that are falling out and that's not good for girls or uh, uh, you know, men and women as we go forth. And as you mentioned, what's happening outside of the classroom in terms of mental health, being, being able to even have the breathing room to try and learn, very important to address. Malala, you're a global role model when it comes to overcoming adversity. Unfortunately, so many have suffered incredible setbacks and continue to be impacted by them. Advice you have for young people that are also facing incredible difficulties right now. I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't think young people need my advice or anyone's advice. Young people already are advocating for their rights. They are speaking out for a more equal, fairer society. They are advocating uh, for climate change um, related policies. They are talking about gender equality. They're talking about their right to education. And I want to bring attention to one issue, and that is the situation in Afghanistan. Girls education has been banned by the de facto government, by the Taliban. And Afghanistan right now is the only country in the world where adolescent girls are prohibited from secondary education. There is no justification for this under Islamic laws or under any other uh, cultural context either. Education is a basic human right, culturally, religiously, and, uh, uh, and, and morally as well. So I, uh, I, am in, uh, I am inspired by all the young women in Afghanistan and around the world who are protesting for their rights. They are raising their voices already all i need to say to them is i stand with you and that's the message that they need to hear from the world that we stand with them we can hear them and that we will take action that we will support them that we will give them a world where they can have access to safe free and quality education they can have the right to work uh, and i think girls children as amina muhammad mentioned like boys children everyone they need our attention we need to promise a safer and a better world to our future generation uh, you know, we have been taking such so long, we have been taking decades and decades, and we should not be living in a world where more than 250 million children are out of school. Uh, so education is, is a way um, for having a brighter, safer future. And we need to ensure that uh, we invest in this sustainable solution for our future and ensure that all children can have access to quality education, they can have dreams and they can make those dreams come true and make this world a better place for all. And we do have just a few minutes left. I mean, I do want to get your take here. UNICEF, UNESCO and the World Bank releasing a report on learning loss that you described as an urgent wake up call. What message do you want to share with ministers of education or finance about investments in education? I think the first thing to do is to remind everyone that education is a human right. It's fundamental and, and every government, head of state and government after security is education, without which we cannot get anything. And, and to, for a minister of finance to be the champion of education, not just to talk about this foundation, but to invest in it. Education cannot be a trade-off. It cannot be either or. Do we do education? Do we invest in industry? It is fundamental to everything. And I think that if we can have education ministers um, seeing in uh, education as an investment in, in the human being, the person, the citizen, the society, uh, then we have a mindset change. Here again, I would say the ministers of education have to stop sitting and talking in a silo. Education matters to everything, just as we say women's rights do. And so therefore, education themselves, the co-convening, creating of the needs uh, that you have in, in, in agriculture, in industry, um, in connectivity, in the digital world, all of that has to happen, um, not just in the education sector, but across all sectors, so that they see the value of it. Um, and that when you're around a cabinet table, which I have been, um, that you're not just talking about the education agenda as though it is not a part of every other um, agenda. So both the finance minister and ministers of education will have to have that conversation and bring it to the center um, of economic growth so that you understand that GDP, the quality of which cannot be without education. Um, and as Malala has just said, you know, it's taken decades for us to do this. What is stopping us? We cannot possibly think that we're gonna grow any, um, any nation, any people um, without the very basics. So we have an opportunity now. Um, we are speaking about the transformation of education. Uh, we will be speaking about the financing. 
every um, domestic budget has to put aside resources for basic services and rights. That is education, that is health, that is water and sanitation. Um, so here, I would say you know, to our colleagues in the finance community, that we've got to think about how we leverage the growth of economies where the returns actually pay for these for the education for health um, and, and are not seen as something we have to go borrow for it, it should be that first charge um, and until we get that we are not going to be talking about all people leaving no one behind we will only be talking about the elite and certain sections of society so i think you know this conversation of transformation of education has to begin with policymakers. Politicians have to understand it, um, and they have to be measured against whether they have an educated population or not, and that that education fits the person and fits the society, and therefore the, that that nation can join uh, the Committee of Nations as an equal partner. And Mari, we have about a minute left, but I, uh, I want to get your take on how you see investing in people catalyzing a greener, more resilient, inclusive development and how perhaps digital technologies and youth aspirations factor into this. Well, I think uh, a lot has been said and I'm in wide agreement with uh, my, what Amina has been saying. So I think investing in human capital is key for development and also for inclusiveness. So whether it's making sure girls can get to school, making sure that no one is left behind and a holistic approach uh, on human capital. It's education, it's health, it's food and nutrition, uh, it's the ability to be connected uh, in a digital way. Uh, so these, it has to be a holistic uh, approach. And and it has to be the priority for the country because it is about longer term development, including green, resilient and inclusive development. Uh, and I think uh, here, uh, just to uh, because you mentioned youth, uh, I think uh, we are in a situation where we had a lot of adolescents, boys and girls dropping out of school and in a, in a slow growth environment. So the issue of uh, being able to employ youth, I think, is going to be a, a very a big global problem. So how do we design design, uh, skills upgrading uh, to be able to have this youth be able to either find jobs or to become entrepreneurs. And I think digital connectivity is, is one of the key issues. But the fact is we have a digital divide still. 2.9 billion people are still not connected. Uh, and it's, it's much higher in Africa. I think it's like something like 70% are not connected to the internet and 43% for developing countries. So it's about uh, the connectivity and once you're connected the digital literacy, what, what do you do to get value added from it? Uh, and then to also really make them inclusive as part of the, of, the, uh, of the education and the job opportunities and the entrepreneur. So it has to be combined with uh, also the ability to uh, access markets, access finance and so on. Uh, and I think the final thing I would say is related to what's the message for policymakers. Uh, I think Amina is absolutely right that, you know, we really need to get to the top a political decision maker that this is crucial for the country's development and it requires a holistic approach uh, in, in terms of the interventions needed and uh, uh, really important is uh, the domestic resource mobilization that goes around it which can be complemented by international uh, cooperation but it needs to start with the political commitment and the ability of the country itself to uh, come up with a holistic program and it has to be a combination of finance ministers education education ministers, health ministers, uh, digital uh, uh, related ministers, it has to come together because the, you want to make sure that the financing goes to where it will have the most effect and transform the education system as uh, Amina said. Well, I do want to thank our panel. Obviously the challenges are many but you've given us a lot to think about today. We do appreciate it. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Hola, I am Jairo Bedoya in Montelibano, Colombia, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meeting. Well, if you've just joined us, I'm Rochelle Acufo, and you're watching Human Capital at the Crossroad. A reminder that you can join the conversation on today's event at any time using the hashtag InvestInPeople. We're also asking you to take part in a special poll. Now, the pandemic has been a major setback to human capital progress. What do you think is the most pressing priority to help people achieve their potential? Is it A, quality inclusive education, or B, stronger health systems? Systems. Do you think C, equitable social protection is the key? Or is it D, 
putting women and girls at the heart of solutions. And your last option is E, jobs and private sector investment. So we're asking which of these five options is the most important in helping people achieve their full potential. You can cast your vote right now at live.worldbank.org and we'll bring you the results at the end of this event. Now, strong and accessible health and social protection systems help build, employ, and protect human capital. Let's take a look at how the World Bank has been helping developing countries protect and invest in their people, especially in times of crisis. Nous avons agi comme des soldats au front, avec des risques pour notre propre santé et celle de nos familles. Pagbakunado, protektado, makakabalik na sa dating buhay. Es el carnet de vacunación contra el COVID. Representa que he cumplido como una ciudadana responsable conmigo misma y con el país. Le gouvernement béninois, avec l'appui de la Banque mondiale à travers le projet GDC, nous ont permis non seulement de renforcer le plateau technique de ce labo, mais d'installer également 12 autres labos. Salomati Aholi, Bahusu Salomati Modaru Kudak, Darmarkazi Tavaju Hibevo is the Hukumati Jumuri Tojikstan Karotosta, as Modari Solim, Kudaki Solim, Tavalut Nubaki. The pandemic has caused severe disruptions to routine and essential health services, resulting in devastating impacts on health outcomes for people, especially on the most vulnerable. But as we've just seen, it also presents an opportunity to strengthen health systems as well as social protection. Our next panel discussion explores how building this resilience from shocks can deliver better human capital outcomes. We're now joined by Senator Dr. Sanya Nishtar from Pakistan, Gustavo Belize, Argentina's Secretary of Strategic Affairs, and Dr. Morena Makwana, the CEO of BioVac, a South African-based vaccine manufacturer. A big thank you to all our guests for joining us today. First, uh, Senator Nishtar, I want to start with you. There are linkages between health and social protection systems. How do they work together to protect and build human capital in Pakistan in particular? Tell us about the, the impact COVID-19 has had and the role technology has played in delivering services. Well, thank you very much. Firstly, let me make uh, four quick points about the synergies between health and social protection. Um, well, firstly, social protection is a buffer against low income and we know that low income is, uh, we know that income is one of the strongest determinants of health status achievement. Secondly, uh, social protection can also protect families from the negative coping strategies, which are part and parcel of shocks and economic crises. Thirdly, uh, social protection can significantly contribute to human capital building through ensuring financial access to education, financial access to health care and nutrition. And, and through this, it can really help improving health and nutrition outcomes. And in the fourth place, uh, social protection can really help avert catastrophic health expenditures and uh, protect people from foregoing health care. 
So we were very cognizant of these, all these four linkages when we established Pakistan's largest social protection program called ASAS, which means compassion in our local language. And we used a number of different programmatic levers to improve health outcomes through a social protection center program and through the social protection ministry. For instance, we've got uh, an unconditional cash transfer program for 8 million families. And research tells us that the bulk of the money is used to buy food rations. Secondly, we've got a nationwide health and nutrition condition cash transfer program and a nationwide education condition cash transfer program. And you'll be pleased to know that in both of these cases, we offer a higher stipend amount for the girl child. We also have a fund-based health financing system to complement the country's uh, health insurance initiative. And then we have a shock responsive registry, which is brand new and has just been created. So very quickly uh, in COVID, through the infrastructure that we built, we were able to reach out to uh, 15 million individuals, 15 million families. And we used technologies and a process that was end-to-end -end embedded in technologies. And I'm very humble to let you know that ours was the fastest deployment globally uh, and the third largest in terms of the percentage of population uh, reached. And Secretary, please, I want to bring you in here. Sustained human capital development requires a whole of government approach. How is Argentina prioritizing human capital progress across health, social protection and other key sectors? Integral human development is the essence of the programs we are launching. Instead of talking only about human capital, we talk about a f philosophical concept of integral human development. We are inspired by what our Pope is doing globally. It's a philosophy that he's uh, fostering, which is improving after the pandemic. And that's how we're approaching our public policy. In the case of Argentina, we've dedicated very important funds to the prevention of um, the social damage caused by the pandemic. We invest more than six points of our GDP in social assistance, also $1 billion in a nutrition plan, emergency nutrition plan. We also covered 60% of the population, the working population, with subsidies to employment, to businesses, so that we could actually prevent a wave of mass unemployment, massive unemployment. And we also strengthen a program to assist families. This program is called Universal allocation by child, and it includes health services and education services. In the midst of all this, we managed to restructure our public debt, uh, the foreign one and the domestic one, with the International Monetary Fund as well as private creditors. And in 2021, we managed to receive or we managed to see the result of our economic recovery, post-pandemic economic recovery, thanks to the measures implemented in 2020. Our economy in 2021 managed to grow more than 10 percent, uh, our GDP, and we decreased our unemployment rate to 7 percent, and we increased investment in 32.9 percent. And we did this together with the private sector and mainly with the technological sector. Argentina is very strong in this industry, and that's why comprehensive human development has to come hand in hand with technological humanism so that all these skills are for the common good. In here. After decades of progress, we do see a sharp rise now in poverty that's been detrimental to human capital. Countries also facing, of course, shrinking budgets. How can we help arrest some of these losses now, as well as set the stage for poverty alleviation and recovery at this point? Well, you're absolutely right, because um, the MDG on poverty eradication was achieved ahead of time, but with the corresponding sustainable development goal, we are sliding backwards. Uh, and I think the answer to this is that governments have to commit to increasing investments in social protection, 
uh, and not not look at it as a cost, but as an investment in the future of generations. And, uh, and, and I can give you the example from my own country, because during COVID, as, I, as I've already mentioned, we reached out to 15 million families, but, and, and we executed a very large cash transfer program, but it was during the initial stages of COVID that we decided to increase our investments in social protection and poverty alleviation going forward. And we did not drop the ball on implementation. So over the last two and a half years, we have brought to fruition the upscaling of a health and nutrition conditional cash transfer program nationwide. We have successfully upscaled our education conditional cash transfer program nationwide. And even while COVID was ranging and we were completely consumed in the execution of the cash transfer program, we've completed the building of a new shock responsive national socioeconomic registry, uh, which will allow us to pre-position cash transfers during subsequent shocks. And we've already tested it dur during an, uh, an earthquake as well. And we're also making and continuing to make these strategic enhancements in data and digital systems, which will bolster our ability not only to uh, upscale social protection systems, but continue to uh, continue to respond more effectively during during shocks. So, so it's all about political uh, will. It's all about investments, and it's all about due diligence and seriousness in implementation. And given how much of a wake-up call uh, COVID has been, Secretary Belis, um, vaccine procurement and deployment are crucial to combating not just the pandemic, but obviously economic recovery as well. And it requires cooperation across countries, multilateral organizations and the private sector. How did it work in Argentina and what lessons are you able to share? The lessons uh, are many. And very interesting, Argentina developed technological capacity of our own and also linked to added value chains, supply chains uh, nationally. We've managed to develop tests to detect COVID-19 in five minutes. We are also developing trials for our own vaccine with uh, our universities and the technological sector. And we've also joined the supply chain to um, work with AstraZeneca. We've donated vaccines to less favored countries, less developed countries. And we understand that there is a difference between rich countries and low and middle income countries. But we all need to have access to vaccines. That's a common global good. I would like to highlight the assistance we received from the World Bank to acquire vaccines. This was an effort that we truly value. And I would also like to highlight the need to understand the concept of public health. This has to be also comprehensive. We need to address health, public health. Um, at a global level, so we are talking about preserving also our environment. In this regard, in the case of Latin America, regional development banks and multilateral banks that are, have a presence in our continent need to capitalize, taking advantage of the SDRs issued by the International Monetary Fund. This is a great opportunity to capitalize our banks and to make sure that a very important percentage of those resources are used in order to strengthen comprehensive human development and to preserve the health of our planet through developing environmental policies that consolidate health in global terms. Rainer here. So as we keep hearing about this holistic approach, what can the private sector do to help arrest human capital losses and catalyze the recovery? And what does the private sector need from the governments to be able to fully contribute to better human capital? Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that I think both sectors need each other, both private uh, and public sector. 
However, I think globally it's, uh, it's clear that the private sector is best at executing uh, and being a little bit more efficient. And therefore, I think if there is a partnership that can be drawn where the public sector can provide the framework that able uh, the private sector to work more efficiently and to be able to harness the type of human capital that it needs. In that way, that is probably the best use of human capital, but also the innovation really has come out of private sector and what uh, human capability can be had. However, that cannot, as I said, uh, work uh, on its own. It will need to work under a policy uh, guidance from the public sector, but also in a manner that enables um, you know, policies and a framework and an ecosystem in which private sector can work in. Well, I know our guests today have, have shared a lot of useful information in really combating these challenges. We do appreciate your time today, Senator Nishtar, Secretary Belize, and of course, Morena, thank you so much for joining us today. A lot of people, I'm sure, will be inspired by a lot of the innovations um, that we've been hearing in terms of ways to possibly strengthen the health and social protection systems everywhere. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Badma Danda in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and you're watching the World Tech Group IMF Spring Meetings. Young people have been challenged in many ways throughout this pandemic, yet they remain optimistic and have ideas for how things can be improved. Now, we asked young people around the world to share their aspirations and some ideas of what's needed to achieve their potential. Here's what they had to say. Hello, everyone. My name is Don Yagudi. Hi, I'm Xin Yu. My name is Gloria Jai. Let me share my ideas with you. require the right support, an enabling environment, and youth inclusion at all decision-making levels. We need to develop our public transport facility with better connectivity and the best time management. Access to energy, I mean safe and clean energy. Then access to the internet. Then access to tech skills. What is most important is education, the utilization of technology and the use of plants. Climate change, seriously. Increasing the amount of foreign direct investment into Kenya and channeling those funds to the businesses of young people who struggle to access capital due to lack of enough collateral and guarantee. A mejora de estos sistemas para prevent child marriage, to stop abuse and violation. Using technology to close the inequality gaps and to give access to everyone. Workshops should be arranged in the communities for the people who have lost their jobs because of the pandemic. Sus empleos debido a la pandemia. To adapt themselves. Con medidas que permitan. Investing in people. Invest in human capital. For me, for you, and for generations to come. The time to invest in people is now. Now, we heard several of those young people talking about the importance of skills and training. It's more important than ever to equip them for the jobs of the future. Our next two guests have been involved in just that, building skills and leveraging technology to create jobs and opportunities. We're joined now by Zina Majali, the co-founder of Crystal, a pioneering business process outsourcing firm in Jordan that makes gender equality and competitiveness a priority. And Beatrice Muhuru, the founder and CEO of GLAD, a management and PR firm in Papua New Guinea. Beatrice is also a mentor to marginalized youth in her country. A very warm welcome to you both. Um, Zina, I'll start with you. You've created a diverse and inclusive workforce at Crystal. Was that always part of your inspiration and vision for the company? And what obstacles did you face along the way? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Michelle. That was always uh, our vision. Uh, we started this company when we were 23 years old. Uh, our vision was always to uh, start the first call center uh, in Jordan, an independent call center that employs youth and a lot of females and be able to create a very safe workplace uh, for them uh, to uh, work in. 
Uh, and uh, thankfully, we've been uh, successful in doing so. Uh, today, we employ 2,000 Jordanian youth, 55% of which are females. Uh, it's a very safe place for them to work in. It gave all these people the opportunity uh, to find a safe place uh, to work in. And uh, that has always uh, definitely been our vision, and we're happy to see it coming to life. And certainly safety, a key issue when it comes to even wanting to be in a place of work. You do want to feel secure where you are. Beatrice, I want to bring you in here. You support young people as they develop the technical and soft skills necessary to realize their potential. What would you say are the most in demand or in need soft skills? You know, amazingly in Papua New Guinea with over eight, uh, 1,000 different languages and 800 different cultures, communications is a core soft skill that's required um, to get them through their day-to-day -day lives. They are uh, living in a world where technology is fast paced, but they come from communities where time stands still. So communications is an in need uh, skill. I think adaptability therefore is also critical for them in uh, moving ahead. Uh, conflict resolution is definitely one of those uh, soft skills that's required. Uh, both to manage uh, workplace uh, conversations as well as their communities back at home. And I feel very strongly, therefore, um, critical thinking is another soft skill that's necessary for youth of today, particularly here in Papua New Guinea. And as we talk about skills that are important to recognize, perhaps some of the skills that don't traditionally get as much attention, Zena, there are certain characteristics I'm sure that you tend to look for when you're hiring employees. In terms of what you think education systems could do to help ensure that students are well equipped for job opportunities, what can you share with us? Uh, yeah, well, um, as Beatrice said as well, uh, there are a lot of skills that we're looking for uh, with our youth, a lot that has to do with critical thinking, uh, uh, knowing how to solve problems. And really what we're always looking at is trying to get our youth to understand how important it is to work today, especially in countries like ours. We want them to understand that females play a major role in our economy and our society. And we want them to understand that uh, no matter uh, what you do, you always need to find a, a job. And hopefully if you're married, for example, you have a dual income and that's something that's essential. So we want them to always realize and understand how important it is to work and while at work to always be aggressive, uh, competitive and uh, to try to do their best just to uh, uh, reach uh, their dreams and be able to, uh, to add uh, all their amazing uh, impact uh, to our economy and society. And uh, one skill that we're always uh, in particular looking for is language skills, I would say. In such a, a globalized uh, world, we need uh, our youth to speak uh, perfect English, let's say. And I would say this is extremely needed in our education systems today to be able to serve customers from all around the world. We need many languages, but specifically the English language is something that is essential for us to be able to hire more people today here in Jordan. And it can be difficult, depending on how you're socialized, to really build the confidence in those things. So then, Beatrice, in terms of policies then, what do you think are the most critical policies that are needed to reach the most vulnerable and bridge these gender gaps and really unlock human capital potential? I feel very strongly that youth empowerment is a policy that needs to be put in place. When you look at Papua New Guinea, where education starts and there's over 200,000 young uh, children in, in elementary and as the pyramid um, um, closes up to for university graduates, we only have 5,000 spaces available for students to enter. So there's a huge gap for um, skills where um, youth are sadly unemployed and don't have the skills either. So youth empowerment policy is really critical uh, for moving them forward in this world. And I feel also the Jesse policy, the gender equity and social inclusion policy is another critical uh, policy that needs to be looked at because uh, women uh, right around the world, and I think particularly here in Papua New Guinea, where we are a patriarchal society, the policies that are there to protect us, uh, our rights, our um, ability to participate without uh, fear or favor. And uh, I think those are critical in today's age, especially for youth. Um, as they move forward, finding their feet, 
I think these two are really, really important. And because women uh, in traditional Papua New Guinea are um, uh, looking at breaking glass ceilings, the uh, gender equality is also critical. So they have equal pay for the amount of hours that they put in. So then, Zina, in terms of what you'd like, in terms of listening to perhaps seeing what the finance ministers who might be listening in on this and messaging that you'd like them to understand about why it is so important to invest in this space when you think of where the public sector comes in and the private sector, what message do you have for them? Um, it has always been our message uh, since the first day that we want everybody's support uh, uh, for our uh, sector. Uh, we believe that this is a great stepping stone for our youth and our females to start uh, stepping into the workplace and either growing in this space or going into maybe something that's more specific to their area of education or expertise. But it's a great place for hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, youth to start and for all these females to start here with us as well. And hopefully they either grow with us and other companies alike or they go into something that's more specific for them. So we feel the more we invest, the more we can grow this space and the lower uh, unemployment rates we can reach, which is essential for us at this point. And Beatrice, for you, obviously you have the ear of a lot of youth in your country as well. Tell finance ministers what young people in your country say that they need in terms of skills and why investing in them is so critical. Um, basic finance literacy, I think, is the skill that's really required for youth of today. Um, as I said, especially in Papua New Guinea, where they've not been able to complete their education, just basic finance literacy is really critical for them. So finance ministers, uh, the central bank, if they can look at uh, I um, inclusion for um, l lending money to this youth who are looking at you know, small, uh, medium enterprise businesses. These are these are critical, um, and they can't go into it successfully if they don't have the basic finance skills. So I'd love for our um, influential people in the areas of uh, finance to consider that, and also governance. I think governance is really critical um, as a skill for young youth that are going into enterprise um, because they can't. Uh, they don't have the skill sets to join organizations, they uh, should be encouraged to start their own. Well, we certainly do appreciate you joining us today with your insights, Zena and Beatrice. Obviously, a lot of impressive stories and successes that I know a lot of people will be looking up to you. We do appreciate your time for sharing that with our audience today. I'm sure your insights and experiences will also provide a lot of good lessons for everybody listening. Thank you so much. Well, I'm joined now by Sri Shridhar, who's been following the conversation online and on social media. So, Sri, what have people been saying? Thanks, Rochelle. Great to see you. Uh, today, people are joining us from all over the world. Let me give you a snapshot from where they're joining us from Tanzania, India, France, the United Kingdom, Uganda, Indonesia, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and of course, here, the United States. And they're using the hashtag for today's event, which is invest in people. And they're joining us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and also Instagram. And they're talking about the ways in which countries can better invest in people and support, and support communities to recover from the pandemic. Now, one particular topic of interest has been education today. People are stressing the need to recover from learning losses during the pandemic and also invest in quality learning. So let's take a look at some of the actual comments that have been coming in on social. First up on LinkedIn, Sara from Tanzania says that investing in a nation's human capital goes hand in hand with promoting and protecting every citizen's human rights. Pretty powerful statement there, I think. And up next, we have a comment from Facebook, Michael in Nigeria, who says, I believe that quality education anchored on quality learning is the bedrock of development. So touching a bit on, on, on how education is really a focus of today's conversation online. And finally, on Instagram, Wilford Williams says that education is a key component of human and capital and investments in education, health and other areas are crucial for economic growth. So a lot of good engagement coming in today. And I do believe at this point we do have some some of the results from the poll overall. Yeah. So today's poll asked what is the most pressing priority uh, to help people achieve their potential? Five options here. Is it a quality inclusive education? Is it stronger health systems, equitable social protection? 
women and girls at the heart of solutions, or is it jobs and private sector investment? Now, these are all really good options to choose from. You know, it, it, it's hard to pick a top priority, but what would be yours? I think given how many children we saw at home, how many, how many, what we see with the skills gap, I would say quality inclusive education, A, but as you mentioned, there are a lot of incredibly important options that really do need to work together. Yeah, so why don't we see how people voted? And we had nearly 1,300 people take part in today's poll. So answers coming up here to the right, 43% of people do believe that the most pressing priority is a quality inclusive education. 12% stronger health systems, 14% equitable social protection, 9% women and girls at the heart of solutions, and finally 22% of people, jobs and private sector investment. So as you can see here, much like you were saying, a lot of people do believe that a quality inclusive education is the most pressing priority. And that's interesting because you would think because of COVID that the stronger health systems would perhaps rate a little bit higher. Yeah, and that's what I was leaning towards too. But like you said, these are all just, you know, such important areas. Indeed. Well, thank you so much. Very important poll here. And thank you to everyone for voting. Sri Sridhar, thank you so much. Thanks. Hello, Lugumi, everyone. I am Late Sunday in Port Vila, Vanuatu, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Spring Meetings. Well, I'm joined here in the atrium of the World Bank Group by Ifat Sharif, the manager of the World Bank's Human Capital Project, and Charles Dalton, a senior health specialist with IFC, the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. Now, they'll be answering some of the questions that you've been posting in just a moment. But first, let's recap on the main points from this event. So what did we learn? Well, first, that COVID-19 has had a devastating impact, reversing recent gains in human capital. That's the knowledge, skills, and health that people need to achieve their potential and live healthy, productive lives. We also learned about how countries have been innovative in building and protecting human capital and were reminded that sustained political commitment and financing are still needed. And we heard about how the World Bank Group is helping countries make more and better investments to stop human capital losses, protect and invest in people and support stronger, more inclusive growth. So now let's turn to Ivat and Sharif. Uh, if I, Sharif and Charles Dalton, thank you so much for being with us today. So our first question actually comes from Victor in Nigeria, and he sent us this video question. Hello, and thanks for having me in this series. My name is Ijom Achibweze Victor from Nigeria. The rate at which the COVID-19 pandemic ravaged humanity showed that the world is yet to evolve a strong healthcare system. So my question is, what does it really require to build a strong and resilient healthcare system that can withstand any form of pandemic? Thank you. So as we heard there, Victor asked how we can be better prepared for the next pandemic and what will it take to build a stronger and resilient healthcare system? That question for both of you. Um, if after, let's start with you. Thank you, Rochelle, and thank you, Victor, for this very important question. Um, you know, building resilient health, uh, health systems were always a priority even before the pandemic. The pandemic essentially highlighted how building such systems are actually part of a global public good. Uh, and the concern really for us is that this is not a one-off, that climate change, uh, unplanned urbanization, lack of water and sanitation, they're all factors that are going to contribute to more such fast-spreading disease these outbreaks. Um, and what we really need is, is a really a whole of society effort um, at the country levels, regional and global levels to uh, help with preparing against such pandemics. So at the country level, you know, what we will need is, is improved health infrastructure. You know, this is investments in labs, surveillance, health equipment um, to really boost up that, that infrastructure. Uh, but equally important that we have learned from this pandemic uh, is the need for a well-trained uh, healthcare system. Uh, staff, uh, you know, the human capital, the human resources that will be needed to deliver not just the vaccinations, uh, but, but essential health care uh, that is required. Um, uh, and so this is, again, going to 
be critically important. Um, alongside, uh, you will also need the support of community-based organizations, right, to add uh, support in terms of, again, delivering the vaccinations, uh, basic immunizations that were short-changed during this pandemic, um, and, and their efforts will be critical. Um, equally critical would be the role of private sector, uh, working very closely with public health agencies in terms of improved research and development work, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, you know, supporting community, community campaigns uh, across uh, countries, um, supporting, you know, privately pr uh, delivered healthcare services. You know, our estimates show, show that um, countries will need an additional 30% increase in their health budget to address uh, pandemic preparedness, and this is not going to be easy, given very tight uh, government budgets. And again, the role of private sector in, in helping to mobilize um, additional resources, the efficient use of resources um, are going to be very important. So it's a again a collective whole of society for effort in terms of mobilizing resources, both financial and human, to deal with the, with the pandemic. Now, what we've also learned from this pandemic is that you know addressing such an outbreak within the country's borders is not sufficient. You would need to work across countries, regions, and globally to address uh, a coordinated action to prevent spread. And here, um, the world. The Bank has been working closely with a number of uh, regional operations to support countries do exactly that, you know, offer uh, coordinated public action towards, you know, uh, investments in, in infrastructure in the country level, but also communication and better coordination um, uh, is, 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 is something that we're supporting. Uh, and finally, uh, the World Bank's uh, low-cost um, financing window, IDA, uh, will be supporting the poorest countries um, with, with, again, investing in their health infrastructure, um, but also to prepare not just for this pandemic, but other crises. Um, thank you. And Charles, how would you respond to Victor? Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of the comments that have just been made. And I think what, we, what we've seen through COVID, that a lot of health care systems have demonstrated some form of dysfunctionality. And I think we need to figure out how we can remove maybe the silo mindset that we've seen and how we can join the dots to create a system. So for me, simplistically, you put the patient in the middle and they say, okay, what services do we need? What human resources do we need? How do we finance it? Because we, as just was mentioned, we've got a massive financing gap. Can we create more insurance coverage so there's less out-of-pocket coverage? We then need to look at the regulation side. We need to look at the whole digitization that, that, that we're seeing. So I think some what, what we're also seeing from COVID is there has been a switch in dialogue between the public sector and the private sector. And I think we need to continue that dialogue and understand how we can how we can promote better understanding, better trust between the public and the private sector. And so where the private sector can support governments, and remember governments are the custodian of the whole healthcare system, and we need to figure out how we can get them to work more together. So we've got supply chain, so we have vaccines, so for supply chain and manufacturing, so we have vaccines, we, we have drugs, we have medical equipment. We also have how can the private sector support more training and development, how the private sector can work with government on gaps in services. So we have seen a lack of ICU beds, for example, during COVID. We also need, we need more lab testing as well, where the private sector, working with the public sector, can, can help. But also, but also on the human resources side as well, so that, that, that training side, as I said. And also, one thing for me is the data analytics better use of data analytics. So if we're setting up social health insurance systems, there's a massive amount of data that's going to be within those systems and the private sector can help the public sector with the tools and the, the ability to innovate and, and just understand how and what that data means so they can get more value and they can stretch that dollar further if, if that makes sense. So, but I think we just need to, we need to look at how we can strengthen the system and move away from the, the, the silo mentality. Thank you very much. No, that's very important, that integration between public and private. This Absolutely. certainly was a wake-up call, you know, for, for all health care systems. Now, I want to get to our next question, and that's on gender equality. And that comes from Amu, also from Nigeria. Now, if Amu asks, how can we empower women for the benefit of all society? How would you respond? 
So, you know, empowering uh, women is really about supporting a process to help women make choices and decisions. Uh, and, it's, and to help with that, it's really about addressing the fundamental constraints that prevent women from being able to make those choices. Um, and so here uh, we see uh, three areas of work uh, that could help um, in terms of context, access to resources, and women's agency. Um, and so, you know, in terms of context, firstly, it's really about offering a conducive context for women to be able to um, make decisions and this would mean sort of uh, changing norms, institutions, uh, often laws um, and cultural expectations to again help uh, women uh, be able to make those choices. Second, it's about offering them the resources that are needed to, ha to have to offer them the tools uh, to again um, uh, achieve the goals that they set for them. So this could be access to human capital, this could be access to financial capital, Capital, social capital uh, that will help. Um, and the third uh, area of constraint is really women's agency. Uh, and what do I mean by that is really being able to give women the tools and, and, and the skills to help implement the decisions that they want to make. Um, and it's really working across all of these three areas that we think would really help empower women. Um, it's not easy to do so, um, but not doing so comes at huge costs to countries, both economic and social. And, and there's a lot of research that shows that mothers, when they're empowered to make decisions, are helping with improved outcomes for children's health and education. Uh, in fact, my own, uh, I've seen uh, through, through first-hand work in Nigeria uh, that, you know, how you know, giving mothers a mere uh, $15 a month, um, you, you know, I saw mothers, um, you know, majority of them using that money to help with the health and education expenditure of the children. And when I asked, you know, uh, some of the fathers, you you know, they use the money essentially for farm inputs to buy fertilizer. So I know this is an anecdote, but it is quite consistent with, with the research uh, evidence that we have um, out there. In fact, uh, uh, a recent study by the World Bank um, uh, suggests that um, not being able to give uh, girls a full 12 years of education could actually cost countries almost 15 to you know 30 trillion uh, US dollars of lost um, lifetime earnings. So this is quite substantial. Um, uh, and, and the World Bank, as a result, has, has actually launched a public campaign, uh, Accelerate Equality, uh, again, to help countries bridge some of these uh, gaps in, in the context, resources and agencies I mentioned uh, to bring in transformative change uh, in women's lives. Oh, that's very interesting in terms of how they prioritise what to spend it on and then when you see this broader payoff as well. Um, Charles, we did hear some, from some earlier guests about the important role of the private sector in solving development challenges. Our next question touches on just that and comes from Diallo from Senegal. Now, Charles, Diallo asks, how does the World Bank Group help promote private investment to benefit communities? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. So I, I, I sit within the IFC, which is the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the, of the World Bank. So our work is really in, is, is to look at work with countries, to invest into countries, to stimulate the economy, to, to create jobs, and just to for a general upliftment of strengthening of, of strengthening the private the private sector. Um, so we we do that with traditional financing solutions plus innovating finance solutions looking to work with multiple entities across multiple industries so we will look at a country we'll see what their needs are and then we, we invest into many many different industries I sit within the healthcare sector focus so really from a healthcare sector focus we look at health services we look at life sciences we look at medical equipment and more recently we look at digital health as well because as we know digital health all of a sudden has had this light bulb moment I want to give you two quick examples and in investments that, that we've made. Um, one is in Asia in an entity called MyCare and they support governments and the private sector from an insurance perspective where they're giving them the data analytics to be able to manage their social health insurance programs better, understanding disease, understanding population, understanding what's affordable, looking at benefit design. But the underpinning is this data management and I mentioned it in my the first question and you can see 
obviously it's something I'm <laughs> passionate about, but we've got to get data management right. We've got to remove the data out of the silos and we've got to look at it in an integrated manner. A second example is in Mexico. So Mexico has a very, very high diabetes and hyper hypertension rate. And so we've made an investment there in a group called Clinicus del Azacor, and they are a dedicated chain and growing chain of clinics working with local populations across multiple income groups where they've designed from a, a people process and technology perspective how to offer diabetes management and hypertension management so they've integrated nurses with clinicians with pharmacists with dietitians and to basically create this one-stop shop and the importance of that is it enables patients to manage their diabetes but not end up in the in in, in hospital where they become economically unactive, if I can call that. So the whole thing is that they're, 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 they're contributing to a, the population to main, make sure that they b maintain their economic activity. So that's really a couple of examples of where we're focused. So we're trying to bring innovative ideas into countries to strengthen the healthcare system, as I, as I said earlier. And so that's really where IFC fits in. And we do that in multiple industries. So thank you. Uh, that's really fascinating because obviously the data then should inform the solutions versus should. sort of creating solutions that don't actually solve the problem. Exactly. So a very interesting point there. Thank you both for taking the time to answer these questions. Lots of great answers. And of course, to you, our viewers, thank you as well. And please continue to post your questions. Our live expert bloggers are staying online and we'll try to answer as many as possible. Well, this brings us to the end of this event. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us and sharing in this important discussion. And of course, I want to thank you, our viewers. We've had quite a lineup of events this past week and they're all available to watch again. The meetings kicked off with a discussion between the leaders of the World Bank Group and IMF on responding to global shocks. We've also been discussing the potential of the digital revolution for developing countries and how to best finance climate action. Now yesterday's events focused on helping communities living in fragile or conflict afflicted situations and explored how to best preserve open trade. Well, you can watch all of those as well as a replay of this event at live.worldbank.org. As you could share your comments on these spring meetings using the hashtag Resilient Future. Well, we hope you've enjoyed hearing from all of our distinguished guests at today's event. And please do continue sharing those comments. We would love to hear from you. I'm Rochelle Kufo. Thank you again.